so much. Uh, I, you know, you're so late. I was going to start screaming, "Welcome to the Justin Abeshi show!" I was going to take over the whole show, but it's too calm. The way you talk is not good, you know. And by the way, good evening, my friend. Happy Hanukkah to you as and well. to all your listeners. How are you? Well, very well. I, I was. I knew that we had a pro in the studio. Oh wow! So I wasn't too worried about the traffic because I figured, hey, I can get some. I even wore a suit and tie. <laughs> I never do that. See, we're on radio, so I'll say that I did too. Oh, okay, very good. You, you happen to look great. He looks great, guys. He looks great. <laughs> you know, our show tonight, Heshi, which I uh, have been wanting to do for a while, and I really uh, appreciate you being a part of this, is to address frontally this issue of what divides hate speech and free speech. I think that and we'll get into kind of some of the philosophical background on that. The, the, the title. Um, for tonight's show is the empathic fallacy. And we'll get into what that means, but it's effectively the, the false equivalent between speech that is denominated as hate speech and speech that is, let's call it for the moment, love speech, and we'll get to kind of the basis of the empathic fallacy. But how do we separate the two in a society that's not only based in the marketplace of ideas, but based fundamentally on on freedoms in all realms. So I welcome you to the show. Our number to call in and join this discussion with Heshi Tischler, and I'll give a little bit of bio for the 1% on listening that don't know who Heshi is. Only 1%? I don't know. I don't even know what my show is on. <laughs> well, we, you have an opportunity. To Wednesday to nights, about. 9 o'clock, everybody. Wednesday nights. I'm on this station. <laughs> Thank you, Toby. You're a good man. So our number to call in and participate is 718 303 9090. If you're shy about being on the air, you don't want to mention your name, you don't have to. You can also text in a question to 917-428-4062. So let's start by giving you a little bit of background on my guest this evening on Equal Footing. Uh, has she heard? Please, please don't talk about my weight. I, I was about to go there. I go good, good. Okay. <laughs> the pizzas, go ahead. Your, your entrepreneurial weight. Okay. <laughs> well, I think you're good looking, even better every minute. <laughs> Yes, you're, you're a businessman. Yes. Uh, you're an activist. You're a radio host. And uh, your your show, The More Heshi Show, is... You're just enough Heshi. Wow. Even you can't get it right. Yes, the Just, just Enough Heshi Show. Just ahead. Enough Heshi Show. Ahead, my, yeah. my, my apologies. I was broadcast uh, Wednesday evening at 9 o'clock on, on this network. Right. Uh, you're also a... You're running for city council. I think we're going to get to that. Uh, I don't want to you know, give away the, uh, the punchline. But these are the parts that I think that possibly people don't know about you. You're a father of three. You're a grandfather. Uh, you have, you're also a foster father. We've, we, we, you can call it that we've taken in a, a, a bunch of kids that are troubled. We work with the parents. Sometimes we take them on for ourselves for a long period of time. Sometimes we just uh, work with the parents. Sometimes the kids, instead of going to youth center, just like hanging out by us, sleeping by us, just staying or you need a meal. So yeah, we take in a bunch of kids. But like the 21 we took in were basically more of a long term. But I get lots of people just popping in or hanging out or I tell a kid in trouble, just come chill with us. Just come get a meal. Just, you know, when they're on drugs or just or they're lost or they're fighting with their parents, I don't want them on the street. Come hang out. Linda will take care of you because I'm no good. Linda's my wife, by the way. Really, she's the no good one. But she's thank God she doesn't know about this show. So I can talk bad about it tonight. Yeah, I know. So, I'm dead meat. She, she screamed at me I didn't take out the garbage, so I'm in trouble anyways. You know, one of the things I think probably some of our listeners don't know as well is that you're passionate. You're not, it, you had been an activist prior to the most recent episode that I think have garnered uh, both local and national attention around the uh, protests, around some of the what you see as onerous restrictions surrounding the, the uh, prevention of the pandemic spreading. But you, you're also... Uh, Key, keen on issues with respect to criminal justice reform, prison reform, rehabilitative justice. That's an issue very close to my heart, as many of our listeners know. Tell, tell us a little about that. I've been doing this for 30 years. I mean, we've been taking in kids, me and Linda, I mean, even before when I was in, in yeshiva, when I was single. I used to help bail out people from jail when they were in trouble. Um, even now we bail out people in prison reform. I, I like people when they come home from jail and uh, they have nowhere to go. What are you going to do with them, Dove? Some of them want to go back to jail. Some of them have no family. Some of them are lost. Most people in jail after 19 months, their wives leave them. Some of their kids don't talk to them. 
Where are you going to put them in a halfway house? Where are you going to put them in a basement? No job. They want to go back to jail. Or some of them have done drugs, and I've had one now that passed away from one. You know, you have kids that they come home, they can't go home to their parents. What are you going to do? Let them sleep on the street? You know how many uh, we've taken off the street, or they sleep in these spas where, where the people do things to them? I, I'm ashamed to say what, what happens to them. But I'm also very passionate about, and I'm doing this a long time. I don't need money for it. Me and Linda do our own. We pack boxes for 137 tonight, people that need food. We've been doing that for many years with Rabbi Fish for, uh, through Sheva uh, I've been part of the board now. Postpartum depression for women. People think it's a joke. You know what kind of a problem we have in our community, the Jewish community? I'm, I'm not talking women across the nation, but I'm talking the Jewish community of Lakewood, um, of uh, Flatbush, Borough Park, Muncie. This is an issue that people, some of them can hurt themselves, commit suicide, divorces, and we get no money. You know, our community got $20,000. You think that's a lot of money? When the neighborhood over with proper, with proper politicians got $43 million. Now, a lot of your politicians, when they go into office, what happens? They're not proper businessmen. They've been politicians or a lawyer or some kind of degrees or just regular people. I am a businessman who's done audits, who knows how to balance budgets, who's hired not one, but hundreds of people. Remember, I used to work in the tenant, I know we're talking more, but I used to work in the projects. And what did I do? I used to hire people. Which I used to go into the tenants association and say, listen, guys, some of you guys need jobs. And she's here. Go ahead, send me one or two or three. Let me see if I can give somebody a crack. I people with me for 20 years. Ashi, let me ask you, because we have listeners across the country, we have listeners sometimes that have, that have participated in by text or call overseas. Not everybody's going to be off fay with New York City politics. You you are uh, a gregarious guy. You're clearly an intelligent guy. Is that guy. in fact gregarious? I think it means fat. Uh, I love you. I know it doesn't mean that. I just... Make it funny, you listen to this. He loves me, don't worry about it. He, 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 he threw me for a loop. That's exciting. <laughs> you successfully threw me for a loop. So the, the dynamic, though, is that despite that, that warm um, exterior, there are people that feel that you have um, engaged in hate speech. And let me give a little bit of background for those listeners who, who are not aware. Um, Mr. Tischler was arrested with respect to a... Uh, an assault that occurred against a journalist here in the New York area named Jacob Cornblow on, on or about October 7th, I think, was, was the assault. And um, the, the, the story that was um, portrayed in the media, and I'm one of those who, who d never believes what they read until I've investigated it uh, fully, but the story that, that at least was in the media was that this was a journalist that had been reporting Follow me, listeners. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit uh, circular. That's allegedly reporting. Actually, you see him on TV calling the mayor, reporting to the mayor. I mean, I'm not really allowed to discuss the a case because it's in court. But before, while you're telling your 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 uh, audience your version of the story or whatever the alleged version is, here's the guy sitting here. Let me tell you something. We had uh, a protest in Borough Park on October the sixth. They somebody else made it. They invited me. I came there. I went to, and this is a fact. All documented, and I'll show you how it's documented. And for, for the listeners to, to be edified in this, the protest was against what? Against that they're closing my schools, they're closing my shuls, they're closing my yeshivas. Sorry, they, who did they? The, the city, the mayor. I mean, right now today I was walking around with a cameraman. Every one of my schools are open. Every one of my synagogues are open. All my stores, JK, Borough Park, Flatbush, not one of us are closed. I have my movement open. My movement has grown that after I started opening the parks, and I did open the parks, which you can discuss with the people, I cut the locks. People were locked in their homes. We shut down our community for four months. People were hurting themselves. Little children, autistic children, stabbing their sisters, going to the hospital. Hospitals not properly taking care of the people. We were just lost. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody stood up. I did my research. I stood up. I cut the locks. I started with the mayor. I beat the mayor. I got all the parks in the city of New York open. A lot of them were open that were not in the Jewish neighborhoods, but the Jewish neighborhoods were specifically closed. And I opened 19 parks in, in Flatbush, Borough Park, and then the politicians came out. But what I want to tell you, listeners, is, is <clears throat> my protest at that particular point in October was we got the stores open. Numbers were down. People were not dying. After July, the death numbers were equal already. And I'm not joking about with people's lives are death. I go to the hospital every morning, though. Every morning I'm in the hospital. So talk about all your other people with all your fake reporting. I'm the guy who's standing there. YouTube took off my video because it's against the World Health Organization. 
World Health Organization does not come into my hospital. Mr. Fauci or Dr. Fauci is telling us how to run our businesses when he can barely run his medical center. So let's take a step back. Just and I don't so hate. I want you to know I do not condone violence. Get this through everybody's head. That second day pro, Mr. This, this Mr. Coleman, which I'm not talking about officially, guys, I know I am, did show up at the first protest. Nothing was happening. I didn't say anything. I know what he did. I didn't care. I left. Sorry, yeah. let me, let the me children quick, were causing trouble, though. Just a quick timeout so people yeah. understand. There's, there's no agenda in this comment, just to clarify. So there was a journalist who was reporting on protests against the COVID restrictions. Not only protests, he was, uh, he, was, he was reporting on synagogues that were open. He was giving out addresses. Gotcha. Taking pictures of wedding halls. I mean, come on, man. Gotcha. And then, and then this person was, uh, was assaulted later. Nope. Sorry, sorry. Again, I know what your accusations are, but if you well, watch, not, not, not you, not you, I'm talking yeah. about in general, but if you would have seen the videos, guys, there's live videos, there's live action, but the first night, this is where the story mainly takes place. The other people created this protest, the kids came out, they stopped the buses, they were burning their masks, I came out to say hello with the councilman, and I left to go to Crown Heights to speak at, at another event that was on the street. It was like a Simchus Basis Shave, a Jewish event, I, I, it was a holiday, and it was a protest holiday, they're saying, listen cops, listen people of the city of New York, you're not going to hold us back, we're going to go out, we're going to dance, we're going to celebrate our God, and you're not going to stop us, Mr. Mayor. And they did it in Borough Park as well. Uh, the police started coming. There was a big problem, and the young men were creating fires. They were stopping the buses. They shut down 13th Avenue. People were being arrested on 14th Avenue. It started to get wild. I got home on my regular trip. Usually I, I go out uh, Monday nights to my youth center. Tuesday nights I, I, I'm off. I go out with Linda shopping from pizza. I love pizza. And, um, and that's what we do. And, and usually that particular night I told Linda, I'm going to go to the street. I'm going to go to Crown Heights. I'm going to come home. We'll have a quiet dinner at home about 10 o'clock. I got home about 11.30. We hit the sack about 12, 12.30. Really, I was exhausted. Remember, I get up 4.30 in the morning. 1 o'clock in the morning, I get a call. Now, my phone is always on for emergencies or deaths or other things that I could do if somebody's arrested. So Linda knows that we are available to answer our phone under most dire straits. We have a lot of people. And I'm behind the scenes. I'm not like the rest of these politicians. I do one thing at a time. Even in my office, I fight at the city, 312 government agencies, one client at a time, one thing at a time. What happened was the police called Heshi, we need your help. The police called me. What do you want from me? I should get over here, because I work with the police. They help me out a lot. When somebody's arrested, we talk to them. Um, people put away. There's a troubled issue in the neighborhood. I work with certain issues. I work behind the scenes with the hospitals and many different things, not in all politics, but whatever I can help. I can't do everything, but there are things that I can do that I'm a specialist in. And I make things look easier, but even with the city, with inspections, with compliance, when, when schools are closed down, I know how to handle problems. This night... I came, I said, Linda, I gotta go. Linda said, are you crazy? One o'clock in the morning? I, and she actually thought maybe I was going to a girlfriend, you know? But I wasn't, Linda, you know that. Linda. I love you, baby, even though 31 years of misery, but I love you, really, no, it wasn't 31 years. Today. Anyways, so the girl loves me, I want you to know that. She thinks I'm still handsome, something's wrong with her. I think her eyesight's wrong. Anyways, so I went, I got dressed, I went back to 13th Avenue, and I walked up and down, I said, everybody, you gotta stop this. It wasn't real fires, it was put out with an extinguisher. And the police came over to me, she said, Heshi, we gotta stop this. I said, what do you want from me? So the leaders got together, and they said, listen, Heshi, we're going to make you a deal. Get everybody off the street. There was about two, 3,000 buses stopped. I got them to let the buses go. And I said, let everybody go home. And they came over to me, Heshi, if you get everybody home, we'll allow you to have a protest celebration the next day. We will provide the music, not me. We will close off two streets, 49th and 50th. They then changed it and asked me if they could change the streets the last minute so the buses could go out. I said, yes. I don't know why they asked me. I'm a nobody. And um, all of a sudden, they asked me simply, has she, we're going to close off two streets and we're going to put all the police outside uh, uh, the perimeter. We had over 20 to 30 police officers surrounding the protest. Kids came out. Music was on. We spoke. We danced. No issues. Mr. Cornbluth came back the second night again. Now, I'm not going to talk what happened with him, but I'm telling you what happened that at 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30, when I went home the first night, he calls and texts me and calls me at 3.30 in the morning and threatens yes, me. Sir, Mr. Jeff was Tuesday night. Oh, you woke people. You, you have to apologize to the immunity. You're some kind of slave. He called me some gay name. I should die. And he called me and I hung up. 
I'm just telling you the story. The reason I'm telling you the story is very simple. If somebody wakes you up at 3 o'clock in the morning, though, even if the dog barks at you, you're going to be upset. And I saw him the next day. I went over to him and I said to him, are you an idiot? You're a rat. You're a pig. I called him names. I agree. And you know when there's an accident on the street or there's a fight, everybody surrounds you. I didn't incite no riot. I didn't threaten him. The cops were there. His brother-in-law was there. He was ushered off in the second. He shouldn't have even come after he threatened me in the middle of the night and bothering me. They ushered him off. The cops were all over the place. My point is telling you there was no incitement. I'm letting you go. There was no there was no involvement. There was no touching, no hitting, and there's all this on video. That's it. We're going to come back uh, from the break in a moment and try to abstract a little bit away from the details of the specifics of this interchange and more about what actually constitutes hate speech. Yes, is, there, is there such a thing? Uh, we'll be right back on equal footing with my special guest, Harold Heshey Tischler. Uncle Heshey. Uncle Heshey. Fair enough. Yes. I, didn't, I didn't mean that as an epithet. <laughs> okay. I, our radio engineer was telling me, by the way, that we had some issues with our phone line in the first segment, so if you if you called and got dropped, feel free to call in again, please. 718-303-9090. If you're having a problem getting through, you can also text a question to 917-428-4062. Okay, we're going to take a step back because there's always going to be different sides of the story. Also, also out of respect, Heshi, I don't want to put you in a difficult situation because I know that there's a, a legal process that needs to make its way through there. And actually, I'm not that interested in the details. Some of our listeners around the country probably don't even know <laughs> what this issue is about. Really, what I wanted to get into tonight is where is that dividing line between free speech, which is so core to this, to this country in, 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 the way that we, uh, in the way that we live, the way that we grow in the way that I would argue we come together, uh, acknowledging our differences and be able to speak our differences, and hate speech. And I want to explain to the listeners why we picked this this uh, title of the empathic fallacy. And uh, there's no uh, uh, untoward reference there. Um, the empathic fa fallacy is, is uh, I think it was first published in the Cornell Law Review in 1992 or thereabouts, and it's this concept of a false equivalency. Uh, it's defined as the belief that you can change a narrative by offering an alternative narrative in the hopes that the listener's empathy will quickly and reliably take over. Now, let's so we don't get too wonky. Let me give you an example of of, of, uh, of the first author. Uh, uh, I think it was Richard Delgado wrote in the Cornell Law Review in, in 1992 of how he the example he used for the empathic fallacy. That is, in the 1960s, the civil rights movement. You had George Wallace, who was an accepted racist at the, at the time. In many senses, it was facing off in the public square against Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King famously said that he, he had to lean into love because he couldn't bear the burden of hate, whereas George Wallace very much leaned in to, to hate speech and, in fact, acknowledged then, to some extent, and certainly later in his life, that, that what, he, what he engaged in was incitement um, to violence, was, was really rooted in hate speech. And the idea behind the empathic fallacy is that 
you let George Wallace in that example um, speak as loudly and as cogently in the public square as possible, and that will allow the listener to to hear that kind of false narrative, counterbalance it against Martin Luther King's narrative of love and acceptance and peace in the face of being attacked, um, nonviolence, and will choose, let's say, the better product. If you think about it, as John Stuart Mill referred to the 19th, 19th century philosopher, the marketplace of ideas. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of our great Supreme Court, just, Supreme Court justices in the 1930s, adopted that into our judicial lexicon, this concept of the marketplace of ideas, and that in the marketplace of ideas, you have different products, and some of them are crappy, some of them are odious. But if you don't allow them to be on the shelves, and people can't compare and contrast, and we have to trust society to be able to choose the marketplace of ideas. My question to you then is, Heshi, do you, do you think that there should be an absolutely free marketplace of ideas, of ideas, or do you think there is some place for censorship? Do you think there is some line that we shouldn't cross where hate speech becomes incitement to violence? And if you think there is that line, where is the line? Very good question, but you know my, what my answer is going to be. No question about it. Free speech, unlimited, no censorship. Let me explain to you my version. I'm not so uh, eloquent as you. I'm a boy from the streets. Father died when I was 13 years old, and I had a long way to go. Fought my way through schools, college, jobs. Um, and I know what it is to work in the projects. I know what it is to get stabbed and trying to be robbed. I know what it is to help people that are being hurt. I, I, I see people living in squalor. I know what it is to sleep on a mattress. And I know what it is to, to go to a nice hotel. So I'm going to talk to you as plain as the street that I can tell you. There's something called CNN and Fox News. CNN are a bunch of idiots, and Fox News is good. CNN is hate. Fox is love. Now, I'm giving you this example is because they should never be hate. All speech is free. No, I don't, you're giving a perspective right, one you know, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, he protested. He had to fight back. He did it with love, but he did protests. He was able to shut down the government. Now, when the government is finally working, you don't shut it down. You're right. The English were, were torturing the Indians, were, were hurting them, were shutting down this country. Weren't allowed, people were living in squalor and food. They built the country up. Americans went in there and showed them how to grow wheat, how to make their country a better place. There's no reason to protest anymore. They're saying politicians need hate speech. That's the way to wake people up. Politicians need to be able to stop a country even though it's running well. I mean, look at us. We shut down the government in January of this year or February, whatever it was, when everything was running smooth. I don't understand why you couldn't keep it running. We're going to get to that. But, yeah. but I'm not even going to give you an example of it. What is hate? Hate means, is, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm one of those people that has spoken hatefully, but against the people that come against us. Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo, your mayor and governor, they've hated. I've shown you proof of hate. I am a bully fighter. That's what I do. I fight bullies who hurt the other people. When you give me hate or you give me a bad word, you know how somebody says to you, oh, you're a dumbbell, just this thing, or your mommy is fat. So I'm gonna, not going to say, oh, I'm taking it like a little girl. I'm going to say, your mommy's fat or you're a dummy. I fight back with the same language that you understand, with the same uh, uh, arrows and bullets. But I don't believe there should be hate. When I talk to the young kids privately, I, I show love. When I go out to speaking events, I show love or I make fun of people. I do it in a way of a loving manner. When people are sitting there or young children in trouble or when I go to be Menachem Oblam, when people are sitting mourning or I go to the hospitals, they don't want me to hear their stories. They don't want to complain again. So I complain about my stuff. These people are sick or dying or not well or, or hurt themselves. You know what they want to hear? They want to hear about Heshi fighting with his wife. They want to hear how my kid uh, is disrespectful to me. That's, you know, the jokes I make or why he's wearing short, uh, uh, you know, uh, wearing skinny pants and stuff like that. I make life more happier. So I believe hate is, should never be out there. I believe um, uh, uh, violence should never exist. But be prepared for them to come after you. And in the case of George Wallace, he really was an idiot. The man knew he had no chance. The way you did it was to incite the people to, create, to do violence. Martin Luther King said no. But don't think Martin Luther King didn't have any hate speech in him as well. He did want love. 
but again, he wanted them to stop hurting them, and he had to give a message. You know, you're absolutely right. Actually, I've, I've, I've read various biographies. Uh, My father Martin read Martin Luther King, by the way, in the 60s. Amazing. He was a Holocaust survivor, and he believed yeah. that my father said, there is no color. And I really believe that to this day. You people think black, white, Asian, there is no color. Some of you people, get it out of your heads. When you see color, of course you're going to hate. I don't hate. I don't see color. I'm upset. I get upset at idiots. And I do speak bad about idiots. And I'm sorry I'm saying this on your show, though. But the man closed my parks. The man closed my stores. I have 101, the man, governor, 101 suicides, 9 billion in the hole. People can't eat. You know what I mean? Not to cry when I see young children cutting their wrists. I'm sad. Of course I'm a laughing joke sometimes. You say I want to be a politician. I'm not a politician. Get it out of your head, my children. I'm not a politician. You know what I am? I'm a fighter. I'm a, and I keep saying this to people. I found it in a movie, this line, though. You're going to love it. It's not really from a good movie. I'm a fan of man. I'm a fan of man. And that's what I'm telling you now. So yes, I'm going to go into politics, though. Yes, I'm going to make changes from the inside because I can't do it outside anymore. You know, you, Heshi, you said something. I just wanted to key on for a second. My parents also were part of the civil rights movement. And it isn't that Martin Luther King didn't feel hate. In fact, he wrestled with that all the time. And he wrote about it. Many of his close friends who wrote about his, his life talk, he talked a lot about the burden of hate. He just chose that that burden was too great. But he, in a, there, there, he honored those who felt it in a righteous way. And I want to, I want to, in the next segment, we're going to talk about COVID-19 and the reaction and so forth. I'd like to hold on this topic. We have a couple of callers. I just want to also apologize again. We are having issues with the line. Uh, so if you're not getting through, please text a question to 917-428-4062. We've had a number of lines drop, for which I apologize. Heshi, the, I was very disappointed as we were preparing for this show that I couldn't get someone who I would say is quote unquote across the table from me, and we're sitting across the table in the studio, but uh, I, I'm, I'm not uh, positioned myself as an antipode, you know, uh, politically or philosophically where you're coming from. I wanted really to have two people talk about this issue of what divides hate speech and, and, and free speech from a completely different perspective in the political spectrum. I won't name names because uh, that, that wouldn't be appropriate given that I, re I reached out to them, but I had repeated uh, declinations from folks being invited on the show who I know would like to be on the show at other times <laughs> for other other topics and the purported reason was that they didn't want to give you a platform and they felt that in fact I got some insults that I was platforming so to speak I don't actually buy that I, I think that there's a there's an underlying fear to get in the ring in the marketplace of ideas and it's not you see you see though it's not the platform they give me. They don't need to give me a platform. I'm, I'm already, my movement has, so what do you my, think my, what I'll do you tell think you, it? they are, my movement is there. I started it myself. People have joined me, not only in New York City, New York State, nationwide, Buffalo, people fighting back, people throwing inspectors out, keeping their stores open, telling the police to jump in the lights, not allowing uh, organizations like BLM and other crazy organizations threaten us, not allowing, they see the police are not even coming after us, now they're sending the sheriffs after us and arresting people in a bar. My, my, what they're scared of is that they can't debate me. They can't stand on the same ground because they are wrong. Usually the establishment, or the man as we call it, they're the people in charge. Your judges, your lawyers, your mayor, your, you think, they think they have the ultimate power. You know, I was in an office with a bunch of politicians about, I don't know, two and a half months ago, two months ago. What was it? It was maybe September. And I went in there to get some permit, whatever. I was only going to meet one guy. When I, when I showed up there, there was five of them, you know, uh, um, uh, all of a sudden sh coming out of the woodworks. And they said, listen, Heshi, for a half hour, to this, you're going to tuck in your shirt. You're going to tell the line. We know you might get elected this time because you're acting a little wild, but don't think for a minute you're not going to do what we tell you. 80% of the budget is already done. 80% of the work is done. And whatever 20% left, we're going to have enough people to give you a hard time. And I took it for a half hour. Then I got up and said, listen, you five little pishers, if you want to hear the right word. I said, when I get into power, I'm going to hurt you. 
I'm going to tell everybody what you did. Any policies that you come up, I'll make sure to investigate. I will walk without my shirt out, even though now I wear my shirt and tie in because my wife has been fighting me with the holidays. I tell you, you look a lot. I look a lot. I know that. Tonight, I hate the tie. I really hate. I promise not to burn any more of her ties. Well, they're fifty-five bucks each, and I'm broke most of the time, so I'm not going to do it. Look at you. You're so handsome with that shirt. I like that. You know, can I get one of those? It's not going to fit me. But I want you to know that I'm telling you now. They're scared. They're scared for the change. They want the new norm. There is no new norm. The new norm is the old norm. New norm is that, look, with the, with the old norm we have, we've come up with internet, we've come up with Amazon, we've come up with deliveries, we've come up with beautiful heating systems in the office. You don't need big boilers. You know, when I was a kid and I finally graduated school, do you know that my computer printer was bigger than this room? What your little skinny laptop there is? Are you joking to me? That was just one of the one of these stupid little chips. And I'm telling you now, we built a world, and you guys are taking it away because you want to control us. Well, no, 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 never, never. And I'm here to fight for the people, and they're scared of me. So let me ask you this question: Because I have I have my platform. I'm going to be elected. I don't need them. So here's let me ask you to to play devil's advocate. And let's say you were across the table from Ashley Tischler. And there are going to be a lot of voters that are across the table that you'd like to vote for you, I'm sure. What would be the strongest argument to vote against Ashley Tischler? So I'll tell you tonight. I have a good friend who's helping me and, and one of his other buddies I, I went to a speaking event last night. Nobody spoke. I'm the only one that got up, had the guts to speak, tell a story, cry about the past. So what should they have said and against I, And I'll tell you exactly. I'm, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what their argument is against me. Simple. You're not polished, Tishy. Polish up. Give it an act. What about on the substantive policy? Uh, some, you, you can't fight me on policy. The only policy that so you... So there's no you, policy area you think that you, that, that you even wonder if you could be wrong? I, I'll explain to you what my policies are. Your, your government is so busy in the left wing of welfare. Our, our government. Our, well, it's not... I, I know. I know. I have to do that. I'm sorry. But um, your, your, your policies are full of... Our policies are full of red tape. 312 government agencies. You have commissioners that do duplicity in five or ten different different organizations. Then you have chiefs, and then you have inspectors who you're telling me can't cross agency lines, but when you have the pandemic, like today, I was on Avenue T, right over here, at Coney Island Avenue, when an inspector walked into a store that was locked, kept ringing the bell. They finally let her in. It wasn't even a store. It's a real estate office. She walked in. They said, what do you want? She says, well, I did ask her, did you take the COVID test in two days? Are you qualified to walk in? And she said, no. They asked her to leave. She left. She called back six of her friends, and I have it on video. She came back, and she started, they posted a ticket on the door. She, she writes on the ticket, $1,000 fine because I saw one person without a mask in an office. You've got to explain that to me. So what is my policy? My policy is simple. There is no policy. There is no rules that you can constantly make up. It has to be legislated. You can't have people like Jumani Williams, who was a city councilman, one of us, and all of a sudden, now he's going to run for mayor. Now he becomes public advocate. He says, you know what? I got the power. I want to shut down the city. We're, Go going, we're going to come back in a minute. Hesh, I apologize for interrupting you. And I'd, I'd like to try to continue this devil's advocacy point. Oh, I have so something can, against so me. You want so badly to find something besides me being fat? I'll find something. <laughs> what, I, what I'm actually looking for is what do you see as an, a cogent argument on the other side? Not a straw man, but we'll be right, we'll be right back fine. <laughs> on equal footing. I'm Joe Tuzman. I'm here with my special guest, Harold, Uncle Heshi Tishler. I love you.
free speech from hate speech or hate speech from free speech. We are having difficulties with our phone line. I'm not sure if that's worked out yet, so you can text your questions to 917-428-4062. Actually, before the break, I had challenged you to play the devil's advocate and come up with a cogent argument along the lines of free speech, not necessarily the specific policy issues in the city, and I apologize because I know that you're running for city council. We're going to get to that, actually, because I think we've got a scoop tonight uh, on, in that regard. But a lot of our listeners are not in New York, and so it's really uh, not really germane to their daily lives. From the perspective of you as an advocate for your community, for your mishpacha, for the, 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 your movement, as you put it on this show, what do you think is actually the most cogent argument if you all of a sudden had to switch sides and you had to actually, you know, kind of criticize your movement? What, what would that criticism be? Well, the, 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 the issue would be is, yes, we hear her, she's screaming, Hala, but, and you're right that he's right, but he won't be able to negotiate things. He's not polished. That means you like right, she's right, but when it comes to he'll lead us. He's a general. You see a lot of times generals lead us into battle, but they can't become president. You have them once in a while. But you can't really be the leader that goes in and sits down and negotiates and says, oh, here's my suit and tie. You know what? I'll give you this if you give me that. You know if Heshi Tishler walks into that room, there will be no plea bargains. There will be no deal. It's all or nothing. No, but you're making a mistake. Keep forgetting one major aspect of Heshi Tishler. I have doing this for 30 years. I do work with the city. I do have to compromise. I scream at my clients and tell them things. I am polished in the sense of the art of negotiation. I am calm. What you want to hear is when I come in the street and I see a big hole. You want me to walk around it. Why? Why can't I walk straight? Why is the hole fixed? You know, we have the 311, 311 system is. It's made to fix problems. Instead, we're using the 311 to rat on our neighbors. And you've, been a, you've been a facilitator in your business life, right? I mean, right. You actually facilitate getting through red tape. I, I think this is a valid point. Every day from foster to, you know, I lost a foster child because I was so close, inches away, but they just, paperwork and another paperwork, and then she died in a fire. Do you know what it hurt me? What do you want me to do? Not get up and scream? Oh, you want me to be nice and polished and wear my suit? Oh, go to her funeral and say, oh my God, Hashem wanted her to die. God wanted, they took her heavenly beautiful soul. No, I'm upset because the government could have cooperated. God wanted us to put that pin through that little piece of cloth. Once you make the hole, he'll help you the rest of the way. I believe that. But if you don't even make that pin hole, you don't even try, it won't happen. And that's my problem. you red tape and I won't put up with it. We got a question here from, I think this could be a constituent uh, for you. It's Susan Rivera from Brooklyn, and it's asking directly if you care about anybody outside the Jewish community. Well, Susan, my dear darling friend, uh, not only did I have a Muslim child uh, grow up by us, by the way, I'm the only one with a yarmulke that can go into the local mosque because I couldn't take it to synagogue, and I helped him with all his violations. So I have hired through my lifetime uh, hundreds of people from the black community, from the Spanish community, many of them. Matter of fact, I have, uh, one, there was a Spanish child that was uh, living by me and a, a couple of blacks. Matter of fact, one of my, uh, one of the men I found in the projects in 1995, Greg, we call him Uncle Greg today, okay, uh, because he, he was working there without even gloves and everything. I'm going back to sell drugs. And he became one of my closest men. I can call him now at four in the morning for him to take me to the airport. And, and it's not that I helped his life because he was any different than somebody else. I have Spanish friends. I know I have more Spanish friends than you. You want me to say that? It's not true. I work in the church. We have, I have a pastor, by the way, too. Yeah, the Hispanic friends sitting right across from me. I love you, by the way, okay? But I, I have Jewish Hispanic friends, too, okay? Uh, and some from Nicaragua. I mean, I really believe it. You guys don't even understand of the, of the employees that I have. My office manager is black. My head, a, a drafter, used to be a car service driver, a you, woman. She's like Latino, you, and she just got married, and I am Uncle Heshi to her kids. Let, let's, let's go to Susan's question from a slightly different angle. Outside is the Jewish community, thing? this is my city. Let, let me ask you this, and I just, I'm asking this out of ignorance, not, not to, uh, to kind of get to a point. Do, do you, is there anything that you've said that's on the public record that would make a Latino or black constituent or potential constituent feel like you were seeing them as the other. As never. No, not, not only, not, 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 not only never, my dear Selma, 
Never, never. You've never heard prejudicial stuff coming out of my mouth. Yes, I've made some uh, comments, and if you want to hear it, I'm not scared. I'm never I'm scared to talk about my past, uh, um, about Palestinians. Now, I have no issues with Palestinians. I used to drive through Palestine before I became Palestine, the, the West Bank. I used to go back through Jericho. I used to stop my friends there. But sometimes when they act crazy, I'll make a comment. I, if, if a mother of a five-year-old kid uh, takes her out at 10 o'clock at night or 8 o'clock at night in the middle of the winter, I'm going to say, what are you doing with her? I make comments. I make jokes. But I, against a race, get it out of your head. Maybe I'll, I, I'll answer act. But nobody in the 56, almost 57 years, by the way, it's my birthday, January 29th, please do not buy me a tie, dome, or your dead meat. Okay, I'm going to put you on. I'm going to get you one of these. You better, you better, but it's got to be like triple seven D zero X, whatever. <laughs> Anyways, I, 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 Susan, not only do the Latin, and I'm telling you now, I have a girl that was a car service driver. Now she's at my head drafter, and she has a baby, and I got her married. No jobs. I've had single mothers. I've had, I have a black lady who's running my whole office, and she used to work in IKEA. My assistant is a senior citizen woman of color because she couldn't get a job because they were prejudiced against her and I said you must be good because nobody wants you and I took her in. So if you want to tell me about prejudice or outside the community, I work in the Bronx, my son. I work in Queens. I work in Staten Island. I work in the projects. Never, never will you ever hear that. And by the way, I'm going to tell you a story. Wait, we have a scoop though. But I, I want to get to the uh, scoop. Before you get to the we're scoop, okay, time okay. But my mother, your point. when I was in second grade, I did learn the N-word. I did come home like every kid and I did say to my mother and she smacked me. She said, are you crazy? Do you know where we are from? And she taught it to all of us. That was the only time I can remember ever saying it. And I was a kid. I didn't even know what it meant in second grade in 1969 or 70. So I want you to know, I understand prejudice from my mother, from my father. And I'll be quiet. Go ahead. So I think you're prepared tonight to officially share that you are going to be for office and where you're going to be doing something. Is that right? Yeah, I wasn't going to really run for office this time. I was going to retire this year. Officially, me and Linda were going to sit back. I was going to sit on my couch, drink my wine, snap my fingers, and scream to my woman, get over here and serve me. Well, <laughs> everybody has a fantasy of life. You know, you guys all have bad fantasies. My fantasy is my woman just to say, yes, as she wants in her life. Yes, I love you, master. Never going to happen. But with all these problems happening and things going on, um, I've decided to run for the 48th district, open time dirt seat, uh, it's not official, but it's official, and we're going to have our videos going out. Um, um, we do have the right till February to switch districts, but we are going. We are preparing now for the Chaim Deutsch seat and my competitors, which really they're no competitors, they're all idiots. I know, I'm not allowed to say that's a hate speech. It's not. I say idiot with love. I'm uh, pretty sure that's not hate speech. Right, 48 I say idiot district, with love. 48th district, for those that are... Flatbush, Midwood, uh, Sheepshead okay. Bay, Brighton Beach. For those listeners that are not in the New York area, to get a sense of, you know, of you as a, as a rising politician, uh, what, is the, what is the demographic makeup of that district? Oh, we have about 30% Jewish, uh, about 10 to 15% Muslim, and they love me because it's not that I only go to their mosque. And remember, I open up mosques and churches. I have my own pastor and my own imam. I give out to the Spanish Latino. We have a church in my community, in the center of Borough Park, where all Jews, that church basically services the Latino community, and we give food out not only to the Latinos. He lets me come in there. We give it out to everybody, you know, and it's not kosher, but he still serves it. So I have we don't have that many Latin, Latinos in the in my 48th district, but we have a lot of Russian, uh, we have a lot of Muslim and Jewish, and a little bit of the black so it's community. A much more diverse community people might think. Yes, it's yeah. not like Borough Park where they're all Jews and, and Asian people. This is really a night, and it's not all Jewish community. So I am going after, I believe that I will win, of course, because of the Jewish vote. I believe the Muslim vote understands that a man with experience in history, instead of just going to pick a woman or picking somebody who's a teacher, a guy who's been in the trenches, has been poor, has been fighting his way up, has been married, has raised children, has done drug rehab, not myself, but I do it for other children. I know about post postpartum depression. I've done a lot in my lifetime from hospitals, fighting government agencies, Plus, I know the demographic of the Russian community, and that is really where our fight is going to be, the Russian community. We're going to take a break in a minute. I, I am pleased to hear, because I'm a firm believer, believer in the marketplace of ideas, that someone as passionate as you, even if people don't disagree with you, is out there running, taking a stand. In the last segment of the show, we're going to talk a little bit more about the policy issue that probably brought you into the 
I would even say the national spotlight to some degree around around COVID-19 restrictions. Before we go to the break, I want to just uh, read a comment from uh, John from Manhattan says, the greatest test of character, character in a community is, the, is to permit hate and then to vanquish it. I love it. So I, love I, it. I think it's important for us to not forget how core free speech is to our society. Supreme Court. I don't accept just, hate. But I'll let them do whatever they want. People need to be able to say, as long as they're not inciting violence, and that's that very difficult line that that uh, that you know, is a, an issue that the judicial system addresses. But Supreme Court Justice Benjamin Cardozo said more than 80 years ago that free speech is the single matrix. It is the single indispensable condition of every other form of freedom. We're back in one I like your voice, you know, that's so smooth, it's oh, delicious. Thanks. I Not like mine, you know, I love you. <laughs> You do. I, I think you are agreeing with me. You're so, you're so good looking. You know, you know that? Oh, say, you're say, just trying to butter me. I am. You see how you agree with me? You, you don't agree that he's good looking. I don't understand. Our, our listeners are always trying to you know, guess at my politics because I like, guess a different perspective. And, and you know, I, I, I try to keep it close to the vest. My politics are actually complex. And I'd like so to. So am I. I. I gather that. And I'd like to get to this. You know, you want, and I'm going to tell you too, I'm going to blame you for this too, Zoe. Okay. You agree with me. Most of you people agree with Heshi going out and fight. <laughs> Who's those people? You, which you, people? You, I just you, want to know which people. All of you, the Jews, the Spanish, the blacks, all of you guys. You okay. know that we're being hurt. You know the tyranny that one guy is coming after us. Whatever it is, COVID, a vaccine, not vaccine, whatever my thing is, open the box. The problem is, when you have somebody standing there representing you, you want a nice, pretty face. You want a nice smile. You want a skinny guy in a suit. You don't want the big fat guy with his unsure talk screaming and hollering. And you know what? Too bad. Because those nice, pretty, skinny people are doing nothing. Those little pretty women or guys are not accomplishing. Hey, we're going to run out of time. I'm I don't care. To I want to tell you that. I'll, I'll tell you right now. Wear the stupid suit for you people. That's what you want. You got it. Even with the skinny pants, I hate the skinny pants. You know, you, you said something great. I, I, look, look what I'm wearing. I know. I do. Uh, the, uh, I, I bet you the socks. It's like a flood. You, you think a flood is coming. What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, I, I actually really appreciated that candor and what you said before. I did, I, at first, when, the first time you said it early in the show, when you talked about being the devil's advocate and criticizing Heshi Tischler, and you talked about well, he's not polished, and, and at first I thought it was a little bit of a straw man, but I, I get where you're coming from, and I think part of what I'd like to give an opportunity here, and, and, and for all of those folks that are listening, it's like, don't give Heshi Tischler a platform. You know what? I am going to give you a platform. Let me give you a platform on policy, because I do think that you've got an important uh, point to make with respect to the way we're handling COVID restrictions, and you've been, to give you credit, 
and I'm not endorsing. I want to be say. I, I want to be very clear. I'm not endorsing um, the ill consequences of the way any of us, you, me, anybody, you know, can can speak and 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 kind of incite bad acts, whether we want to or not. But in terms of the substance of your approach around the COVID restrictions, I think there's actually a lot to agree on. Can you succinctly describe to our audience, not just our city audience, but our national audience and, and, and even abroad, what is your bone to pick with the way that we're approaching, approaching restrictions of the pandemic? What should we be doing differently, concretely? You do not have the ear of the people. You are not. You think that you have your policy is right. We listened to you in March, April, May, and June. We shut down our city. We locked ourselves up for 14 days, 21 days, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Nothing worked. Your Fauci character keeps telling us the second wave is coming. The second wave didn't come. We figured out that you go home, you take care of yourself. You know, I had a guy, I was sick last year for two days, and I was snapping my fingers, screaming at my woman to serve me. <laughs> she didn't come. But anyways, and, and a friend of mine was sick the same way with pneumonia, and he went to sh synagogue and shul, and I told him, don't go, you dumbbell. You're going to get sick. He died. He died from pneumonia. I went so home. it's not that you denied. You, you have, have to, to take. Sick. You have to take care of yourself. Right. You have to wear the coat. You have to hear the, the heat on. You got to take your cough medicine. You got to drink your teas. You got to eat healthy. Okay, I'm fat because I like pizza. But besides that, though, the policy is you're not uh, the same way the governor was able to go block by block by block to figure out where the red zone is, which was another lie. Because I went block by block in my community and did testing, not in the street contaminated testing. 2,000 tests in my neighborhood, 24-hour tests in proper, in proper offices and doctor's offices. We are now in yellow. While the other communities that are taking the city tests stay red. Don't you think there's something wrong here? Work with the people. I would have created a Citizens for Safety Action Group in every borough. I would have taken health, health professionals lawyers, doctors, uh, 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 clergymen, making organizations, co community activists, not two, three, five people committee members, 100, 200 members working block by block. What are your issues? What can we help you with? What food do you need? Where's the PPE? Not $7 a mask. Of course, people didn't wear masks in the beginning. They couldn't afford it. My wife is paying $7 a mask, which you get for free today. Well, get, let's do a little time out there and talk about the mask for a second. And we're coming up on time. We have, I've had a couple of texts here from uh, Why healthcare, don't you wear masks? healthcare workers. Idiots. And I'm going to condense this, this commentary I just received um, from Margarita. Uh, and it, it, it seems to me from the context that she's a doctor. And I she, work with many doctors, by the way. In, many health professionals. In, 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 to, in some, given our time, she's effectively saying that she supports a lot of what you're saying in terms of the exaggeration to the pandemic, the response as it's effective affected our economic livelihood and mental health and so forth. But why is that inconsistent with also asking people to make to wear masks? Why do you protest I'll wearing give you, masks? I'll give you it seem like, I hate, by the way, I hate wearing masks. I, hate, I have a mask, but, but I, I do it. But if, you go into What's somebody, the if you go to somebody's store, wear the mask. You go into somebody's house, he asks you to take off your shoes, you do it. Or don't go into the house, don't go into the store. Here's the question I have for you, my dear friends, and all the people out there, which half the doctors who come to my office love me. You don't wear the gloves now. You go on trains where, where they're cleaning the trains for three hours, but you have rats that come in packs that laugh at me. They dance around me in the train stations. That's how dirty these stations are. When you're arrested, which I was arrested by your idiot mayor for no reason, put me in a jail with 12 people less than this, smaller than your studio room, then on another room with four people, nobody wearing masks, people didn't go to the back. We're, we're in a luxury suite. Here, okay. So, yeah, uh, compared to... A jail cell you are with 12 people crowded in, together, people locked up for three days not showering. Some of them have defecated on themselves. I had to sleep on a floor dirtier than the gutter. So they don't practice social distancing. But here's my question for you, my son. If masks work, then why do you need to have six feet of, of, of social, whatever, social distancing? Let's just say you're right. Masks work, social distancing work. Then why do you need the lockdown? Now let's go a step further. Masks work. You need the masks. You need the social distancing. You need the lockdown. Then why do we need the vaccine? Do you, and if the vaccine works, why do you need then not to have any uh, any clause that says they're not responsible? You you're lying, 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 lying. You've announced tonight that you're running for the 
48th, yeah. 48th district, Brooklyn City Council. That was that was a scoop here. I'm not it. going for mayor. I'm not going for governor. Maybe this later. No, no, no. So, you're making I'm, a mistake. Do you, I'm fixing you from one to 51. For your constituents, because we're running up on time, do do you support mandatory mask wearing God in forbid. public places? Stop right, right now. Stop it. In the street, it doesn't even Fauci said it's not there. Guys, I'm going to be one of 51. Once I get in, it's not only the 48th district I represent, it's this city. I'm going to create a coalition, an alliance of 51 members. Out of them, I need 26 votes. I'm never going to let a mayor do this again. I'm never going to let a mayor create an executive order. We can't recall this mayor. I'm going to file a bill, one of my first bills that we're going to be able to recall elections. No more executive orders unless there's a state emergency, and it better be a state emergency. Then I'm going to go to each of the state assembly and the councils and the senate and try to do the same law against governor. People say, Heshi, you know, somebody... Tells me, has you run for governor, run for mayor, make it a show. Afterwards, you'll be like this guy ran for mayor for the too damn high rent party. Now he lost the election, of course. And what happened? He's now a famous star making a million dollars on TV. I don't need the money. I don't want the money. I don't want to be mayor. I don't want to be governor. I don't want to be famous. But I want a city councilman. I want to fix my city. I want to help my neighbors. I want to feed the poor. I want to get the homeless off the street. You have 69,000 homeless people, 20,000 children. But they don't spend the pandemic. Heshi, thank you so much for being on the show. A couple of housekeeping things. We have had, and I apologize, this is the first time it's ever had, we've had technical difficulties at times, but Heshi, you know this studio well. I don't think you've ever seen this. We've had our phone lines down. We've got multiple calls that have been dropped. I want to apologize to listeners. I, I think there's an opportunity for you to owe me another show. I will. Don't forget, but I'm <laughs> yeah. having a Hanukkah party Monday night. Everybody in the city is invited. Wear a mask if you want. Be stupid. I don't really care. But I'm going to have a Hanukkah party. Watch my Twitter. Oh, don't forget, guys, I could use donations. HeshiTishler.com. Can I say that? H-E-S-H-Y-T-I-S-C-H-L-E-R.com. Guys, five, ten, fifty dollars Get me elected. Don't let the big people come and own us. Let the guy, the unpolished man, represent Heshi, you. we got 20 seconds left. Yeah. Is there anybody you want to apologize to? Mr. President, I'm sorry New York City screwed you. I'm sorry you got messed up. I apologize, and I do apologize to the mayor and governor for being idiots. God Not me, God, yeah. I don't necessarily don't agree you, with the man in front of you, I but, you. I, but I, I appreciate you. Am I good looking? I think you are. I, I love you, though. I'm, I'm going to give you a hug and kiss with no mask. <laughs> I'm coming over here. Actually, we're going we're gonna to have you on again. God bless free speech. God, God bless, bless free speech. God bless the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fifth Amendment. Good night. Let's go. Okay, it's safe, though. Dope. We had, wonderful. We had like I'm grabbing your ass. Miss Look how nice so you look. Sorry. I'm so sorry. What happens when I saw your screen go dead, I wanted to tell you right away to make a new booty. It happens all the time here. It's really... Okay, so yeah. I did so when I saw your screen go bad, it had to be rebooted. That's why. Okay. And, and as a problem with my mic, you notice that you're touching it. Like... We have to refresh the page. I'm sorry. The person you were trying to... It's not even on the YouTube, my channel. It is, I just saw it. No comments. No, no. Yeah, hello? To my brother's house at uh, 10 o'clock. When did I post? Grayson. What? What? Who erased it? Oh, I don't know what's going on. I'm not posting. I don't know how to get rid of it.